Today, PhD physicist Gerald Schroeder is here to tell us how to believe in God in five minutes or less. However this turns out, it should be interesting. Now before we begin, I have to ask, if you are new here, please take a moment to hit that subscribe button. It helps the channel out tremendously, and I greatly appreciate it. With that said, let's do this. My name is Gerald Schroeder. I have I have a thank God a strong science background from MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, bachelor's, master's, PhD, seven years in the physics staff. Seen a whole range of atomic bombs detonated. Moved to Israel. Met my wife Barbara Sofer, a great writer, and uh, then uh, teach Torah and science. So luckily, I'm, I'm I'm lucky that I have the two that come together. And one of the questions yeah, is a, that I'm asked as a scientist is how can a scientist really believe that there's something that we refer to usually as God? That is an excellent question. That's what we're all here for. So please do go on. You know, is this metaphysical whatever acting in the world or producing the world? And the irony is the question is really a non-starter. Science has, in fact, discovered God. Really? How? Why? What? Who? When? How is this not all over the news? Science has discovered God. Breaking headline, film at 11. Tell me more. And you can talk to the hardline atheists and they will say, it looks like science has indeed discovered God. What? <laughs> what? <laughs> I... <laughs> First of all, I don't know of any hardline atheist who would say, well, it looks like science has discovered God. Second, if it were true that science had discovered God, there could be no such thing as an atheist. We would believe there was a God. We may not worship that God, but we would believe it existed if science had discovered it. What are you talking about? And how would that be? Well, if you take the trouble of going to the web and, and they're typing WMAP, the initials for, for a satellite. Ah, yes, the Wilkinson Microwave Anisotropy Probe. That would be one of the satellites that we've sent up over the years to investigate the cosmic microwave background radiation. It's a fascinating story that you can learn more about in my video, The Big Bang, How Do We Know What We Know, from uh, several months ago. It's amazing, the discovery that was made there. But what in the world does confirming the Big Bang have to do with discovering God? It's a diagram that shows the development of the universe from the creation over time. It's a timeline. That's not quite true. Um, this, the, the, the part that you can see on the far left, that blue and green and little hints of yellow slice right there, that is the cosmic microwave background that's been observed by the Wilkinson probe. The rest of it is a fill in the blank sort of thing. Every word on that diagram comes from the NASA site. It is the condensed knowledge of the scientific community of how the universe created and how it got to where we are today. Each of the lines, the vertical... So, hold on, hold on, hold on. Every word of that diagram comes from the NASA site. Well, the diagram itself comes from the NASA site. I've seen that before. So, I should hope every word on the diagram comes from... Strange word choice, probably. It just... It feels like he's trying to make a case that isn't actually there in the data. But let's see where he goes with it. The lines is another billion years. Okay. Is that true? Let's let's see. Um, on, on the far right, we have the present day. So one billion years ago, two billion years ago, three billion years ago, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, and some change, I guess. So, okay, yeah. All right, that's pretty neat. I did not realize that about that diagram, that the uh, the vertical lines, the rings around the, the funnel uh, represent a billion years. It's pretty nifty. And you start from a burst of energy at the extreme left side of the diagram, and you end up at the far end with the oval. The oval sh is to indicate expansion in all directions. Of course, because it's a timeline, we can't show that on, on a single piece of paper. Yes, uh, three dimensions is hard on a two-dimensional piece of paper, although this is an internet graphic, so not technically on paper unless you print it out, but details. 
but showing four dimensions, all three spatial dimensions plus time, is incredibly difficult to show on a 2D surface. This graph is actually quite ingenious. We see here, most amazingly, that on the extreme left edge, it shows a beginning to the universe. Now go back. Well, no, that's not what that says. That says quantum fluctuations. And I have to point out, that's still theoretical at this point. We don't know what happened in the moment of the singularity. But whether you call it quantum fluctuations or vacuum state decay, or maybe it was a god. Whatever the case was, it doesn't mean it's the beginning of the universe. It means it's the beginning of the current instantiation of our local space-time. There very likely was something, but it doesn't really compute in a way that makes sense because the term before we hit a limit in our understanding of what before even means because that's where our current instantiation of space-time comes from. So there is no time to speak of before that moment. But to call it a beginning, it's almost as misleading as Ray Comfort calling it creation, thus requiring a creator. Less than 50 years. If I were teaching that at Tech, I might have, you know, a person could lose tenure saying that there was a creation of the universe. It sounds like it's Bible. Yeah, if you say creation of the universe, it does sound like it's from the Bible. But no, 50 years ago, we had already discovered the cosmic microwave background radiation. It was pretty clear that the Big Bang was very likely true, even at that point. But even if it weren't, you certainly wouldn't lose tenure for presenting the general theory of relativity and examining the implications of that, because that, after all, is where the Big Bang Theory came from. It's an entailment of the nature of general relativity, which was already confirmed in the early 20th century. Because less than 50 years ago, the overwhelming scientific opinion was the universe is eternal. That's very debatable. The overwhelming religious opinion was that the universe was eternal. Because, of course, a perfect God would not create an imperfect and limited universe. But I don't know that I'd be comfortable saying the scientific opinion was that the universe was eternal. There certainly was considerable debate over it. Fred Hoyle and his friends made a very big stink. For those of you who don't know, Fred Hoyle is the man who gave the Big Bang its name. He was trying to be derogatory and gave it something that sounded childish and silly. His pet theory was steady state model because he did believe the universe should be eternal and he was trying to work out a way that could possibly be. However, he was kind of the laughing stock of the scientific community for it, so I don't think it's fair to say the majority agreed with him. There was never a beginning. The Bible is wrong from the very first sentence. And then we discovered, suddenly, Arnold Penzies and Robert Wilson, the Bell Labs in New Jersey, the northeast of the U.S., discovered the echo of the Big Bang, the energy left over, which George Gamo... Not to nitpick, but that's not quite accurate. It's the relic radiation from the last scattering. It's not the energy left over from the Big Bang. They're two different events. 60 years ago, predicted that if there had been a universe created hot and small, it would have exploded, and the energy would get more and more dilute, and the, and Penzias and Wilson, these Arnold Penzias and Robert Wilson. Also not correct to say that it exploded. It expanded. It's a very rudimentary mischaracterization. Now, maybe he's trying to speak at the level of what he thinks the audience will understand, but a PhD physicist ought to know better. Discover this energy that had been predicted overnight the Bible got it right. There was a beginning. No, absolutely not. In fact, the man who first came up with what we now call the Big Bang Theory, George Lamatra, was a priest. And when he presented his information to the Pope, the Pope immediately went there. Oh, Genesis is confirmed. And Lamatra said, don't you dare. This is not that. The man had stones, I'll give him that, to stand up to the Pope himself and call him wrong. But it's true. This is not that. The similarity is superficial at best. And the universe very well could be eternal. 
just the current instance of our local space-time has a start point. To the universe. Now the black in the diagram is nothing. It's not a vacuum. Vacuums are within that diagram, within that cone of expansion. Back vacuums are empty space, and space is something. The black of the paper around the diagram is nothing. No. No. Our friend here, the good doctor, is making shit up. In fact, we do not know what is beyond the bounds of our universe. We have no way to know. We have no way to observe or even indirectly detect what is outside the bounds of our universe. But the probability of it being nothing, it's not measurable. It's certainly not 100%. It could be something. It could be anything. It could be more universes. We do not know. We can not know. So to assert it is nothing, that is, in the words of the illustrious Richard Feynman, not even wrong. It doesn't fit in our human brain because humans think in a box, a box made of time, space, and matter slash energy. No human, as clever as they might be, as expansive as they might be, thinks out of that box. So when we say outside that diagram is nothing, we can use the words, but we can't conceive of nothing. It doesn't fit in the human brain. If no human can conceive of nothing, then how can you assert that there's not? Clearly, you can conceive of it, at least on a very basic level, or you wouldn't be able to assert it. And if you can do it, then other humans can do it. None of that has anything to do with the point. That's not demonstrating that there is a nothing. It's saying how unlikely it is that a person can conceptualize the concept of nothing. That's not proving your statement at all. So you're still not justified in asserting that there is a nothing. And we're still no closer to demonstrating how this has anything to do with a god. How are we going to have this idea, is there a god or not? No. Well, yeah. We're, how, how do we get there? Show me. Connect the dots for me, my man. Notice that the creation force isn't a three-letter word, G-O-D. If you look at the words carefully, it's a quantum fluctuations. That understanding was first brought down by Ed Tryon, brilliant human being, in the journal Nature, almost 40, 50 year, 40 years ago. The universe allows creation of something from nothing, provided you have the laws of nature, the quantum fluctuation. Tryon realized that you can create something from absolute nothing, provided you've got the laws of nature, quantum physics and the laws of relativity. In other words, the laws of nature. Yes, you would have to have some type of cause and effect situation in order for a thing to transform into something else. I don't like the quantum fluctuation answer because it's too much like hand-waving. It is hypothesized. It's been presented. It's been shown to be plausible. It is one way things could have gone, but there is no way at present to demonstrate that's how things did go. So I, I just don't like it. It feels like dodging the question to me. I'm much more comfortable with a that's a possibility, but we do not know yet. So look what science has discovered. We can create the universe from absolute nothing, provided we have the, the, the forces of nature. Now the laws of nature, the forces of nature aren't physical, they act on the physical. So if they create... That's not entirely true. The forces of nature as we commonly understand them have to do with the interplay between reality and the things within reality. You need a reality. Uh, for instance, gravity doesn't work without mass. If there were no mass around, then gravity would effectively be non-existent. It may still be there on paper, but without something to interact with, it has a null effect. A similar thing with the electromagnetic forces. If you don't have something generating a distortion wave in the time-space field, then you don't get electromagnetic radiation. The universe, that means they predate the universe. That depends on how you define things, doesn't it? Because if they are part of the universe, then they do not predate the universe. 
It's possible if you want to define the universe as the matter that comprises the universe, that they could exist before the universe. But if they're part of the universe, then you would have to concede that the universe did exist at that time, but did not have matter within it as yet, which is supported by our best models. Set of forces, we call them the laws of nature, that are not physical. They, they are physical insofar as they interact with physical things, like matter. That are able to act on the physical, they create the physical from absolute nothing. No, we don't know that that's what happened. We don't know that anything can create anything from nothing, because we don't have a sample of nothing to test, to observe, to verify that hypothesis. It may be, but we don't actually need that hypothesis, so we have no reason to think so, and we have no driving imperative to accept it tentatively anyway. For example, it very well could be that a previous universe was all, all the matter was sucked up into a black hole, creating a singularity. If it was a universe's worth of matter, then when that singularity inevitably decayed and erupts in a different direction of space-time, perpendicular to the previous universe, that's not nothing. It's a something that's converting into a different something by adherence to the very physical laws that we're saying had to pre-exist the current universe as we understand it. You don't even have to have a nothing to create something from. It hasn't been demonstrated, and it's not necessary. And they predate the universe, which means they predate our understanding of time. Saying it over again doesn't make it true. Put that together, it sounds very familiar. Oh, it looks like a maple leaf. This sounds like it might be Genesis, therefore Bible confirmed, I guess. If you haven't noticed it, that's the biblical definition of God. Oh, is that the biblical definition of God? Not physical, acts on the physical, created the physical from nothing, and predates the universe. Okay, I kind of see where he's going with that, but no. In Genesis, God is very much physical, of course, acts on the physical, but anything that affects reality certainly does, uh, created the physical universe from nothing. Once again, we don't need that hypothesis. We don't have any reason to believe in that hypothesis, and we have no way to test that hypothesis. So saying science has confirmed it is completely incorrect and predates the universe. How does that even make sense? And once again, the biblical God of Genesis is very much inside time. So much so that he had to rest on the seventh day of creation. And that without even getting into the life of an incarnated Jesus. There's only one nuance that's left, 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 left hanging. We can talk about it another time, perhaps. It's that which created the universe, those forces active in the universe. But up to that point, science says, we, you are correct. The, the definition of the biblical God is predates time, outside of time. God is not a physical being, is, is a force, and it creates the universe. That's not what I would call the biblical definition of God. Now, of course, it depends on which Bible you're looking at. But if you're taking your definition from the Bible, then the only requirement is that it be named Yahweh. It be an entity within the universe with a mind whose identity is equal to Yahweh. That is it. That's the biblical God. Or more precisely, that's one of the many gods who happens to be the God of the people of Israel and their descendants. You'll notice that the opening chapter of Genesis, the only name for God is Elohim, God as manifest in the universe. Science has indeed discovered the biblical God. Well, we just need one part left, crucial, that which created the universe is also active in the universe itself. The very fact that you're watching this now pretty much establishes that point. So we just have a big old bunch of assertion and we're going to call that proof. Science has discovered God because undemonstrated assertions and misleading falsehoods. I mean, we expect that from apologists, but from a PhD physicist, for shame. For that, you actually should lose tenure because that's just bad. And then for that final piece, oh, well, the fact that we exist, just that we can take that as a demonstration. Come on, come on, get out of here. Get out of here with that nonsense. 
Well, that was more than a little disappointing. I was expecting him to at least stick to science, since it's supposedly scientific proof. But, okay, let's just point at science, say, look at the trees, and that must equal God. And, my goodness, my goodness, I... You have to reach really, really far to even present that case, and it still doesn't hold up to even the most minute scrutiny. But it was still a fun ride, so thank you guys so much for watching. Thank you for subscribing. A big thank you to our supporters on Patreon, channel members, and others who help keep this little bandwagon rolling. And as always, remember... You don't have to misrepresent science and make up a bunch of shit potentially risking your career because you are better than religion. The, the smoke alarm in my house is going off because of the smoke from the wildfires that's, that's seeping into the house, so that's fun. Now, if you're new here, please take a moment to hit the subscribe. It helps a channel. It helps. Fuck. <laughs>